You're listening to the Good Question Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Our goal is to make each of our guests exclaim, Hmm, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. Because when that happens, it means you, the listener, may be inspired to learn more beyond the interview and to ask great questions yourself that lead to new insights. In this podcast, we cover historical and current anthropology, comparative religion, and history. Welcome, and let's get started. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the The Good Question Podcast. Uh, today, I'm very excited. I have Jay Villamoret. He's the founder of Skulls Unlimited. Uh, he created what's called the Museum of Osteology in Oklahoma City, which my wife and I visited about two months ago. I took tons of pictures and had a bunch of realizations from seeing the skeletons and, uh, you know, put it together into a little book. And I, you know, we reached out to the museum and, uh, you know, the founder, Jay, has agreed to talk. So, Jay, thanks for coming. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I know in the museum, I, I thought for a moment, oh, no, Jay died because there's a replica skull. It's not Jay's actual skull, but a replica. But when I first saw it, I was like, oh, no, the poor founder passed, but you haven't, thank God. But, but tell people, if you would, a little bit about your background. Like, how did you get into caring about skulls and creating this museum? I have been involved with skulls and skeletons nearly my whole life. I was seven years old when I found a dog skull in the woods. I was out on an outing with my brother and my father. We stumbled across an old blanket that was rolled up in the woods. I unrolled it, and being a seven-year-old boy, my brother and I thought we found a uh, just a rolled up human body. So we went back to my father. He came and looked at the blanket and he knew it wasn't a human, but he saw my enthusiasm. He saw my natural curiosity and he encouraged me to collect the bones, take them home and let's learn about what this is. Only later did uh, we determine that it was a dog. So apparently somebody's dog had died. They wrapped it in a blanket, took it out to the woods just to discard it. That was the beginning of a lifelong obsession. So at what point did it did it transfer over to the museum? Like when did the idea first come to you and why? Well, when I graduated high school, I graduated as an auto body technician. I was cleaning skulls as a hobby, selling, you know, making a couple hundred dollars a month uh, selling skulls just to friends and family, different things like that. And uh, this was in the middle of the 80s in Oklahoma. We were at the end of the oil boom. So we like to call it the oil bust. And I was having difficulty staying employed. So I uh, started the company, Skulls Unlimited. I told my wife if we could sell $2,000 skulls a month, that's all the money we'll ever need to live a happily ever after life. Uh, So we started with a one-page price list promoting ourselves to schools, colleges, museums. And because of the company, my collection, of course, grew. And my collection grew to the point that I wanted to do something more with it than just keep it in my home. So uh, I had the idea of coming up with the Museum of Osteology. When I started the museum was in 2003. We didn't actually open the doors until 2010. So it took about seven years of uh, building the museum in our spare time and spare revenue to even open the doors. And when they opened, I honestly didn't care if people came or not. I did it for myself. I kind of was just another feather in my own hat. And to my surprise, our first full year, we had 65,000 people visit the museum. How about uh, nowadays? How many people go on average? Now with COVID, we had our worst year with COVID, but uh, this year we're going to close about 45,000. So we're still rebounding, but we're not going to quite reach the, you know, the 60,000 mark. At least it doesn't look that way, but summer may surprise us. From the outside, it just looks like, I don't know, a regular building. When you go inside, I would say if you pay, if you pay attention and look at every exhibit, there's two floors. It probably could take you a good two hours to really go through everything. So it may seem at first like, oh, there's only a few things, but there's a lot in your museum. I was really surprised. It was cool. Yeah, there's over 700 specimens on display, which represents only about 10% of the museum's holdings, because we have over 7,000 specimens in the museum. We have animals that a lot of museums are envious of. We really do have a special collection uh, from humpback whales to hummingbirds to gorillas, to just about anything you can ask for, we have in our museum. Very cool. How did you get the replica of your own skull done? Uh, Well, with the modern 3D scanning, I went and had a uh, CAT scan or MRI, I don't recall which one it was, done of my own head, and then I sent it to Idaho. There's at the Idaho Museum up there, they actually do 3D printing. And uh, so I had my skull printed, you know, as a boy, I always wanted to hold my own skull. And of course, that's one skull that I can never hold uh, and study and examine my own skull. But now I can. It's the next best thing. 
Do was it freaky when you first saw it, or what do you think when you look at, you know, a replica of your own skull? When I look at a replica of my own skull, I determined there's absolutely nothing special about my skull. Here, I was I was expecting, you know, something really cool about my skull, but I'm a absolute run of the mill Caucasoid. Nothing special about my skull at all. But well, you might not want some special things about your skull because I would think that that would mean something's wrong with it. You know, maybe be yeah. happy. It's- yeah, well, I jokingly say I, I thought there was going to be a big brain and all that. But, of course, there, it's just very normal. You should show it to your wife. Be like, look, see, it's not any thicker than normal. You say I'm thick-headed. <laughs> no, she says I'm thick-headed regularly. So, yes. And now I can show her. Because, you know, believe it or not, 3D scanning is accurate on the inside and out. Oh, really? So wow. The thickness of, of the skull does represent the thickness of a person. So, yes. Is there any um, desire from the public or anyone to do what you did? you know, with their skull or their whole body to get this 3D process done? And could that be something that you guys set up or is it too expensive and complicated? Well, it's not super expensive, but it is a little bit, you know, it was like the 3D scanning of my skull was like, I don't know, two or $300. But then the printing was about a thousand. So, you know, you'll, you'll have 13, $1,400 invested in just having your own skull scanned and printed. Well, so, it's really cool that you could do that though. I didn't know that. That was really cool. interesting. Oh, it's super cool. Does anyone mistakenly think that you passed away when they see that like I did or no? There was a time that I was entering through the gift shop and uh, I held the door for an older lady and she saw my shirt. She didn't realize who I was, but she saw my shirt and she tapped me on the shoulder and said, I'm really so sorry to hear that the owner never lived to see his dream come true. And, it, <laughs> it, you know, it took me a moment to realize what she was referring to. But when when she did, I went out to the museum and reread the sign just to be sure we were clear. And of course, we were. We were perfectly clear. Uh, she just didn't read it accurately enough. I guess me, you know, again, for the first few seconds, I was like, oh, no. But then it was OK. Yes, so, exactly. Going back in time just a little bit, you, you said that you were cleaning skulls and earning like a side income. And then it became your main thing. How did you find skeletons and skulls? Were you just foraging out in the wilderness or how did they come to you? Well, mainly back then, letter writing campaigns i would find go to the library and find lists of like animal breeders animal farmers uh zoos started contacting zoos different things like that just trying to get my name out there telling people that i wanted skulls and you know and before we came along you know like trappers and hunters they were just throwing all that stuff away so the moment you want it you know they perked up said well how much you paying for you know a coyote skull or whatever and uh you know they were more than happy to save it it just offset the cost of you know doing what they did a lot of doors get slammed in your face as well. So you got to be, you know, you got to have a thick skin and expect that. But you weren't like Burke and Hare from the 1800s that, uh, you know, would steal corpses in order to study them or sell them to medical school. So exactly. thank God, I guess all your, all your skulls were properly obtained. So Yes, exactly. Yeah, we're very adamant that all of our animals that we sell in our company and have on display are all, nothing's destroyed for our purposes. No animal is killed directly for their skulls. So what are some of the real interesting ones that personally to you were like amazing or that that gave you some insight? Well, our humpback whale is pretty special. There's only 12 humpback whale skeletons in all museums in North America, including Canada and uh, Mexico. And we actually have two of those 12 in our museum. Only one is on display. So that's really special. You know, humpback whales aren't like the rarest thing in the world, but to find, you know, a 40 ton animal is so nobody collects yeah. they're really hard to come by yeah what i noticed is that you know the humpback whale being the biggest some of the giraffe stuff are pretty big but from that down to the smallest you know the mole rats and the tiny little the birds that you know their bones are so thin it's like you could just crunch them like sardines and eat them it looks like oh but for the sure. same structures the same patterns go all the way up the scale to the humpback and all the way down you know every every creature wasn't you know 100 percent the same but they were all pretty similar. I would say like 70, 80 percent similar, same structures, you know. That's what people tell us all the time. They're really impressed by the fact that animals are so different, but yet at the end of the day, we're all so similar to each other. Even reptiles are very similar to a mammal and a mammal similar to a to a uh, bird, etc. So it's all the same concept. I think that's what fascinates me so much. How did you do some of the real delicate ones where the bones are, again, are just whisper thin or the snakes where they have like a thousand vertebrae you got to put together with the right spacing? 
Well, believe it or not, we actually have beetles. We have insects that eat the meat off the bones. So an animal will come to us as a carcass. We have to hand cut all the meat off we can, just like you were deboning an animal for the meat. We're deboning it for the bones. So uh, we're do so we're taking the meat off after the meat dries uh, to a beef jerky consistency. We have insects that will actually eat the rest of the meat off the bones, which will leave the bones in the most perfect condition you could ever ask for. Oh, so they help you with the last part of it. Oh, really interesting. Yes. Without the beetles, our job would be extremely more difficult. How long does it take the beetles to do their work? I know it depends on how much flesh and all that stuff, but on average. Yeah, it depends on the specimen. We always like to use the example of a human skull, for instance. If we put a human skull into the correct colony, and what I mean by that is a colony that's really active, they could literally clean a human skull in one night. Uh, wow, so you've done that? Come in and the whole skull is clean. Oh, yes, generally. You know, sometimes we'll leave it in there a few more days just because we want to make sure it's 100% cleaned. Something like a coyote skull, beaver, bears, different things like that. It's just a day or two. Now, if the colony's not working great, it might take a week or two. So, What kind of beetles are these and where do you find them? They're called dermestid beetles. Uh, They're carrion meat-eating beetles. They're found throughout the world. There's about 500 different species of dermestid beetles in the world. Their main focus in life is to... uh, just eat meat off of bones. That's what they do. They come in in nature. They come in after the maggot has left the specimen, after it's just dried meat and hair and feathers. That's when the dermestids come in and finish cleaning the bones. So we bypass the maggots by using knives and hand cut as much meat off as we can. Have you ever set it up? You had a, you know an animal that had died and you recreated all the steps that would happen in nature with the flies and the maggots? And Or is it too disgusting to do that? Oh, we, we've done it. You know, there's certain specimens like something like the humpback whale was taken from the beach and allowed to rot naturally. So it decomposed naturally in a farmer's field. It sat there for two years before we came along and collected the bones. So yes, we do use nature in certain circumstances. Are the bones out of whack when the beetles clean them or is everything kind of in the the right position? How much studying do you have to do to reposition the bones and, you know, to make it look like the actual animal? Well, depending on the species, if it's big enough, something, let's just use a coyote or a beaver or something like that. We're going to let it fall completely apart. 100% will fall apart because we know what we're doing and we know how to reassemble it with not, with not a whole lot of effort. If it's something small, let's say a hummingbird, we don't put a hummingbird in with the beetles. We put beetles in with the hummingbird. So we basically would take like a little container, put the hummingbird in there and put literally three or four beetles in the, the container and monitor it by the hour to make sure they're not going to overeat it and the bones will fall apart. Oh, with the beetles, when you say overeat, what are the what happens when they do that? Well, the bones will fall apart. So every rib will fall off. Every finger will come off. Every toe will come off. And if it's small enough, you don't want that to happen. It's way too difficult to try to put the bones back together. It can be done. We've done it and we do it regularly, but given the opportunity, we're going to try to stop that from happening on little things. So do you have, have you ever talked to any paleontologists? Do you have any insights that would be useful to people that, you know, are archaeologists that that dig up really old stuff? We have a few friends of ours that are paleontologists and, uh, you know, they've used our services in the past. They've been customers of ours. So yeah, we have an ongoing relationship with uh, several of the the world's renowned paleontologists. Yes. Yeah, I mean, is, is there anything that they've told you about that is their job a lot more difficult than yours or yours difficult or just different? Like what, so, what kinds of things have you learned? It's so different. What they do is so different from what we do. They, of course, aren't dealing with specimens that have meat on them at all. They're dealing with literally rocks. It's something that they enjoy doing, and this is something that we enjoy doing. You know, I'm more involved personally with uh, extent, not extinct. Extent is the modern word for animals that are living. And uh, my focus is extent, not extinct. So, you know, our paths cross, but, you know, we don't really get involved with each other too much. Okay. Any um, other observations that, um, I don't know, really surprised you in your own journey with the bones? Like things that you've learned that you're, I don't know, you're just amazed about. We've been doing this a long time. The smell is amazing. Let me just tell you there. Uh, There's not a day that goes home that you don't take a shower the moment you walk through through the door. When you play with death, you smell like death. And uh, our stuff come in, you know, some of our stuff comes in a week dead, two weeks dead, you know. 
most things coming in are fresh, but you know, you start compiling as many species as we clean in a month and uh, you're going to have some odor. There's no doubt about it. After you handled this stuff, have you ever been around dogs or other animals? Like, do they smell it and avoid you or come to you or do they notice? Um, Every dog I come in contact with will smell my shoes intently. I've been traveling around the world in exotic regions and people, the dogs will come up and just won't leave my shoes alone. They just like the smell of death. We've had employees that'll take their shoes off outside on their porches and the next morning their shoes are gone. The dogs, the neighborhood dogs will come up and steal their shoes. Really? Oh, yes. I guess it's prized possessions for them and they love to chew on them, you know? Oh, and they smell. So yeah, it's very exciting for them. Interesting. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's um, fun. You know, some people wouldn't consider it fun, but we do. Yeah, one observation I had is um, I looked at how horns will come right out of a skeleton. And I realized like the, the skeleton is literally coming out of the body, whether it's a horn or a claw or, you know, some other structure. And when I looked at my own fingernails, you know, they, they don't appear to be, maybe I'm ignorant, but they don't appear to be anchored to my skeleton. But a lot of the features that these animals had, the bones are literally just a continuation of the skeleton. And I realized, wow, that must give them a tremendous amount of power. Like imagine a ram ramming you and the horns are literally part of their skeleton, how integrated that is. And the force, I think, would be tremendous compared to what force we could put forth, you know? Oh, exactly. Yeah. It, it's That's what's so amazing behind what we do is to be able to see that stuff up close. Like a muskox, uh, you know, it has a skull that could be up to seven inches thick. It's just amazing to think the force behind those horns when they, you know, when they're sparring. Yeah. And we talked also about the, the similarity. So I thought of cars. So the skeleton's like a chassis and you could put all these things on the chassis, like, you know, this skeleton and that skeleton is similar, but this one has claws on it. This one has plates on it. This one has this on it. You know, so it's like this, again, this chassis, this, um, this palette that different things have been added onto to make all the different creatures. It's pretty incredible. That's what we like about it so much. And that's what continues uh, to fascinate me. Every morning, it's not very difficult to get out of bed because I really enjoy what I do. Yeah, that's very cool. Also, too, um, you know, the bones will appear like bones do, you know, like whitish. And then where they exit the inside, you know, let's say horns of uh, an oryx, all of a sudden the bone changes dramatically. The color, the texture, the thickness, you know, the surface features. So it's amazing to me that there's a seal there. You know, I don't, I, I don't know, I don't know enough, but I haven't seen like things leaking into an animal's body at the site where a horn or, or a claw comes out. So the, the system seals itself really well. And then second of all, how do the cells know to dramatically change at that point and make a different structure? It's really interesting. It's fascinating. That's what keeps me going is we see things like that on a regular basis, especially when new species come in and we haven't had a chance to play with them uh, just to see so many differences, but yet the similarities between them is it, it's just, overwhelmingly exciting yeah well any any other insights that you've gotten from handling all these skulls over all, or all these bones over the years like what else have you figured out maybe that you haven't talked about in the museum or on this interview like any other interesting details to share well i've already said it once but the similarities but yet the differences is always incredible you know when you see a bobcat versus a coyote uh you know like a, a bobcat the eyes in the front the animal will hunt you look at a deer, the eyes are on the side and the animal hides. Just little things like that. The kids really like, I, I like, it's really fun. You know, we get 60,000 visitors on a good year coming in our museum. And it's so pleasuring to speak to these kids. And, and you know, they, they're just really overwhelmed themselves. And I think we've made a difference in people's lives, you know. It's just yeah, a lot of people really seem to like what we've done here. And uh, sometimes I even impress myself that. We've really accomplished something that people seem to really like. Yeah, that's really cool. When I when I went home that night and I look at my cats, I can see their skeletons in my mind's eye. And I, I looked at the cats and I'm like, oh, yeah, it looks just like their skeletons. And when I looked at, you know, we have birds, too. And I looked at them and I saw their skeletons and, I, and my dogs. And it was weird. I, I like for a moment I had an X-ray vision in a way. And I looked at them because I just looked at skeletons of you know of these animals and i'm like oh yeah it makes sense it looks like that looks you know it's weird well i have had people will tell me that jay i bet you look at people and just imagine what their skeleton looks like and 
unfortunately, I have to agree. I have done that. You know, I've looked at people and think, wow, you're a really big guy. You must have an awesome skeleton. It's just really cool. <laughs> have, you, have you ever, have professionals ever come like orthopedists or, again, uh, you know, a group of paleontologists or archaeologists or, you know, medical students? Do they come through your school ever, like groups of those kind of people? We get a lot of medical students come in. Surprisingly enough, we get a lot of uh, like physical therapists will come in, like schools with physical therapy or uh, other nursing students. And sometimes I wonder why they're coming Be because, you know, we have a human display, but it's not a very large human display. It's just one window of 40. But I think they're, I think they're here to see the uh, the similarities and the differences, you know. I guess as a student, it's... And we're in their backyard, so why why wouldn't they come? Yeah, maybe you should open up a chiropractic place right next door. That'll be funny. Probably should. Yeah, call it vertebrae. The vertebrae cafe or something. Yeah. Uh huh. Exactly. If we ever so, got big enough and had a cafe, that's we would name it that. Yeah, yeah, that'd be really cool. Um, so looking towards the future, what's next? You know, you just you're happy and satisfied with the museum, or are there more plans that you have to do more things? Oh no. No, we actually had a second museum in Orlando, Florida for five years. And about six weeks before the pandemic, we actually closed that museum. Our lease was up and we're converting those exhibits into traveling exhibits. We're going to have word in the next few weeks if we're going to pull it off or not. But if we do, it'll be like any of the other traveling exhibits you see that go from museum and science centers from one to another, like the body world, you know, like mm. the body display. So. If everything goes right, in the next couple of years, we're going to have traveling exhibits coming to a town near you. That's really cool. I remember I saw the bodies exhibit in New York exactly. know, like 10 years ago or something. It was awesome. Yep, but it's still traveling. And so we're going to be traveling with several hundred skeletons, and uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. That'll be the next chapter of the museum. Yeah, no, that's really, really cool. Excellent. Well, very good, Jay. So if, if people can visit the museum, you know, it's in Oklahoma City, and I, I definitely suggest they do. It's awesome. If, they, if they're not local, can they order certain things from your, your store in the museum? or? Um, oh, of course. Online, do you have videos of the museum, like a virtual walkthrough? Or like yeah. what else can they do if they can't come? Uh, well, we have our gift shop online. We have our company online. The company is SkullsUnlimited.com. The museum is SkeletonMuseum.com. And you can see all of the exhibits. You can see what you're going to get before you get here just by going to the website and checking it out. You can buy tickets ahead of time. That way you don't have to wait through the lines, even though most most of the time there's no line. But the weekends there can be. Okay. So, well, very good. Jay, it was really great to meet you. And uh, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I, I had a great time in the museum. I suggest everybody check it out. It's really, really cool. So thank That's you. awesome. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to the Good Question Podcast. Please email support at the good question podcast.com if you have any referrals to great guests for us to interview. Visit the good question podcast.com to hear more interviews. And please help us spread the word by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen to this podcast. 